Hello and welcome to Code Bytes, sponsored by Search 5.0. I'm your host, Stephen Turkington, and on today's episode, I'm pleased to welcome Patrick Larkin, site lead of XG's growing Belfast operations to the podcast. Code Bytes exists to create an accessible pool of mentors across our tech scene, as we still find aspiring technologists without that go-to to develop and enhance their career. This is an area close to Paddy, as we hear of his personal experience and gain insight into his journey and a glimpse of the demands across market data and low latency, along with a valid observation on celebrating employee tenure. This is a great conversation and I hope you enjoy. Paddy, a very warm welcome to Code Bites. Thanks for having me, Stephen. Good to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you and I'm even more excited to hear the journey of global production support. I think we've got some great guests coming in outside of the perhaps software engineering that we've had of recent, such as security and and also data. I myself actually recruited in application support in London, in your market in financial technology. So I'm really looking forward for you sharing your journey. So without any further ado, I do want to kick things off and Give our audience a bit of a background of your journey. Yes, no problem at all. So you know, growing up, I wasn't really a technologist, I must admit. I was more of a sports fanatic. So anything football, rugby, athletics, anything at all in that field, I was either playing it or watching it on TV. So I wasn't one of these ones who was a gamer or building PCs in my spare time. It just wasn't for me. And then actually, I wanted to study law at Queen's. Um, so I'd applied to do that. And I needed three A's for my A-levels but I got two A's and a B. So I was scrambling around going, what am I going to do with my life? I don't really, not, not quite sure. So I looked at, looked at Queen's through the clearing process. When you don't get your degree, you have to go into that process. And I stumbled across a course called Business Information Technology. So even then, I wasn't quite sure what that course really was. <laughs> so the first day, I kind of knew it was business, half business, half IT. And that's the way it transpired. It was like that. But during the course, even the IT side of things, it was programming basically. And I could do it and it was okay, but it was a bit of a chore, but didn't really love it. I looked around at other people in the class and, you know, they couldn't wait to get assignments and they were itching the, the program and I got through it in the end, I got first class honors and everything that was fine, but I was graduating and I was thinking, I don't want to be a programmer and I've, I've done a, an IT degree. So what am I going to do here? So I, I came across the New York Stock Exchange. They were advertising in Belfast. And that just perked my attention. First of all, why I was in New York Stock Exchange in Belfast. And people locally in Belfast will know they, they acquired Wombat Financial Software. But long story short, I got into their graduate program and I was actually meant to be a business analyst as part of the graduate program. But a month into the graduate program, they said that we're short on the customer support side. Do you mind helping out for a couple of weeks? 13 years later, I'm still doing customer support. Never get back to that, that business analyst rule. What could have been eh? But But yeah, so I joined New York Stock Exchange and I was on the customer uh, support side of things, and I just loved it. It was a perfect fit for me. I love the customer facing aspect, talking to the clients, seeing how they're using our solutions. I love the kind of, you're the bridge between the clients, engineering, QA teams, you're the, right in the epicenter of the whole company. And the technology was interesting, the business was interesting. My colleagues were all from a diverse background and great technologists who were teaching me a lot of things. So yeah, it was just a perfect fit for me. and. What really set it off for me was, I think after six months or a year or so, I was asked to go across to New York. And I'm from a very normal family in Belfast. And next thing I was in New York, I was on Wall Street. I was meeting our clients. I went on the New York Stock Exchange trading floor, wore my suit, 21 years old. So it was great. It was just brilliant. So that at that point, I fell in love with the industry. And I kind of made a, a pact with myself that I would really get my head down, learn my craft, learn the technology, get to know our clients. And Never really looked back from that point, to be honest with you. And 13 years later, I've worked in various different customer-facing roles, technical customer-facing roles, account management, professional services, application support. Fast forward 13 years, I work for a firm called Exigy. So we are a market leader in real-time market data, historical data, order execution services, amongst other things. And my current role, I'm the VP of Global Product Support. So I look after the uh, level one, level two, and level three support teams, and that's globally. So we have teams in Belfast, Manila, uh, St. Louis, 
London, New York, pretty much all over, really, to be fair. And yeah, it's great. It keeps me on my toes. And then more recently, last year, I became the, the Belfast site lead. So actually, gee, we have 50, around 50 staff in Belfast across a range of departments, you know, engineering, QA, support, business analysts, in case I do go back there. So yeah, so that that's my journey. So it's stumbled into technology and didn't want to be a programmer. But then once I found a customer support role where I could interface with clients, but also be technical, it just seemed to be a perfect fit for me. And I tell you what, for somebody who perhaps doesn't have a passion for coding and still managed to get a first class honors back in the day in, in university, that's brilliant. And it's just great to hear how you're able to navigate and stumble across something which you find a passion for and an interest to be at the customer facing. And it takes a particular person with the soft skills to be wanting to get into that environment. And um, if you were to reflect in your career, has there been a defining moment that's perhaps grew you as an individual? Yes, definitely. You know, I did quite well when I joined the New York Stock Exchange. It just was like, it was a good fit for me that I really enjoyed the industry and the first couple of years all went to plan and I was promoted into a management role um, quite early in my career, but it was under the pretense that I would have a manager locally in Belfast who would mentor me and show me what it was to be a manager and run a team. So at that stage, I was the, the manager for the European support desk. Now, this coincided with the quite a lot of restructuring at the New York Stock Exchange and they were moving their US shift to Belfast, so creating a brand new shift in Belfast. And also moving their their teams from Tokyo, Singapore, Hong Kong to Manila. So a brand new team in the APAC shift as well. So this was all happening around that time. A lot of moving parts, new team members. And then my boss, who was my mentor at the time, was meant to be in charge of doing all this. But he decided to, to move on, I think after around three weeks when I became a, a manager. So I was left without my mentor and someone to show me what it was to be a manager. So there was a massive void there um, to try and fill. So I was kind of, as I say, a new manager, I was young, I said, I'm going to try and prove myself here. I'm going to step up into this role. I'm going to help hire this new shift in Belfast. I'm going to train the guys in Manila. So I just worked my socks off for probably a year or so, 12 hour days, 14 hour days, put myself in front of every customer at each call, every kind of project, any kind, anything at all. I was kind of throwing myself in front of it and trying to be the hero. And I did that for a year and it was great. Then he hurt my stripes and everyone thought, oh, Paddy's brilliant and he's doing all this and that was fine. But at the end of all this here, when the, the work was done, I actually was in the office one day and I felt a massive pain in my side. And long story short, it was appendicitis and I got to the hospital just before my appendix ruptured. And I don't know all the kind of science behind appendicitis and how it's caused, but I definitely think it was a result of being run down from working too hard, putting my body under too much stress, mental stress. So I was out of work for a period of time after that, and I kind of reflected to myself and said, you can't sustain this here. If you want to be a manager and you want to progress your career, you can't be a hero. That hero culture can't work. You have to actually develop yourself as a manager. So you have to develop what it is to delegate, train your team, develop a team, work with other managers, and, and so on. So when I came back after that there, I was a much more well-rounded manager, and I've carried those kind of principles throughout the rest of my career. Yeah, I think that was a big turning point for me because at the start, you're young and you're a new manager, you want to earn your stripes, but you probably do it to the detriment of your, your mental health and also your physical health too, in the end for me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think certainly at that younger age, we'll have a sense of creating ourselves, you know, and yeah. leading from the front. And I think delegation is an art in itself and a skill set which you do learn. It's just a shame that maybe take it to that stage to actually learn yeah. that. But how, how important, because it's very important for us to protect and, and future-proof our industry and obviously avoid burnout. You know, how important do leaders play in that role with their staff? It's so important. You know, that time I had a fantastic boss and he's still a really good friend um, today. And he came back and he, he said to me, we put you in a management position because we believed in you. You didn't need to prove yourself after you became a manager. So mentorship and someone like that who can guide you through your career is just so important. Having someone who knows your strengths and your weaknesses as well was really important and they've walked the same path as you and someone who's honest as well and can share the, the good and bad experiences because this particular individual I'm referring to, he made mistakes and he told me that if you're doing something like this is the things I did wrong, so this is what you shouldn't do rather than someone saying, oh, I did this and I did this so well and this is all the things I did. So having that honesty and integrity for to talk about their negative experiences too is, is quite important. I think mentorship in general is, is just so important and I think just making yourself available to people. 
is, is a key thing. Everybody's busy. Everyone has busy schedules. You can find 15, 20 minutes in a day to have a quick coffee with someone, to, to bounce ideas off them. And what I found is now I manage managers. And when they come to me for advice or they want to talk through different ideas, 99 times out of 100, they have the right approach. But it's just getting that positive affirmation that, yes, I am doing the right thing. And because they maybe haven't crossed this, this path before. And they generally have the right approach, but it's just getting that a bit of confidence. Yes, this is the right way of doing things. So mentorship and leadership in, in this industry is, is so important. So that's the purpose of this podcast. There's plenty of people out there who don't have a go-to within their career. So I think they're valuable tips to be passing on. In your opinion and experience, what's the biggest challenge that the industry currently faces? Yeah, I, I can go a little bit niche on my own industry, the challenge we face, and it's it's a technology challenge, really. So in the world of market data, the volumes of market data being sent from the exchange that we have to process in real time are ever growing. So there was one study that the volumes have doubled since 2019. So for the past four years, the volumes have, have doubled. So to put that in the context, one exchange in the US, an options exchange, they have told us that our, our systems should be able to cope with 120 million messages per second. Huge volumes of data. Now, I coincide this with our client expectations. Our clients want us to do this, to process the data, but do this by reducing latency and reducing hardware footprint. <laughs> so it's, it's a real challenge. Now, thankfully at XG, we've been in this business for 20 years and we are very skilled and experienced in doing this. And just recently we released our sixth version of our ticker plant, which is our signature product, which is able to do this. So again, it's reducing the latency, reducing the hardware footprint. And then my team's role in this here, we have to roll these new ticker plants out to our customers. And then once they're rolled out, we monitor them on a 24 by 7 basis. We do the automated changes, any kind of uh, improvements, new features, we roll those out. So yeah, so from our industry, it's a crazy situation where the volumes are increasing, but the client's expectations are also increasing. So we have to reduce the latency and reduce the hardware footprint. And just on the latency side of things, when I first started like 13 years ago, working on the support desk, from a timestamp perspective, clients would ring in and say, I want my timestamps in a millisecond granularity. And then milliseconds change to microseconds. And then more recently, some exchanges are supporting nanosecond granularity. <laughs> so it's just, it's never ending. But it's what keeps us challenged, keeps us busy, keeps the, the mind going. And I think it's why people stay within the company because that problem solving element, it's constant. So you never get bored. So yeah, that's probably the biggest industry challenge I face on my day-to-day -day basis. And the balls at such a rapid rate. And even just those numbers you put out there, it really is mission critical at the yeah. same time and yes. and probably if we were to move on to the world of talent as you alluded to it's probably certain aspects of high performance as well i'd imagine to be involved in in that sort of environment what, what would you look for and identify in, in good talent in today's market yeah it's difficult post-covid because most of the kind of interview process is, is done remotely like this and you don't get that five minutes before and after the interview where you can see someone or drop their guard a little bit. So it could be a challenge. I think someone who is passionate about the industry as well, because sometimes recruitment firms get people, they apply for a role and they can sometimes don't really understand the role. So you have to be passionate about the actual industry you're in. Someone who's motivated, someone who's a good communicator, they don't have to have the perfect CV or the perfect background. They don't have to have first class honors or a perfect career. So someone who's driven is very important. Also, it's important to understand what you're recruiting for. So on the customer facing technical support side of things. We have people who are working on a certain project, maybe extremely technical. So we may have to recruit someone who's got good customer facing skills. So that's important. And then how do you retain that talent is also important. And I think that at XCG, we do a really good job of promoting from within internally. So that also shows people that if you stay around in the company, you have a really good chance of being promoted. So there's no better example of that than our CEO. I think he started as a graduate or, or very junior level. Then over the past 18 years, he's progressed to the, the CEO of the company. So it kind of proof is in the pudding for people that if you join the firm and you do well, you'll progress and you can, you can reach a senior role. So good talent, as I say, they don't have to have the perfect CV, don't have to have first class honors, just as long as they're driven, they're motivated, they're a good team player. One other kind of quirky thing I use sometimes as well is visualization. So when you're speaking to someone during the interview process, you don't have to close your eyes during the meeting, but maybe after, how do they communicate? How do they answer certain questions? How do they tackle certain problems? And then after you can look at the team you have and can you visualize that person in the team? 
And I do that with my manager sometimes as well, because sometimes you'll think, I just don't see them as a good fit. I just can't visualize them in the team. Whereas sometimes you'll say, yeah, they're a perfect fit. I can see them speaking to that customer. I can see them talking to those colleagues. I can see them working through that problem because the way they spoke during the interview process. So visualization, I think, also helps sometimes, which is a little bit quirky. works for me sometimes. Yeah, it's knowing your people and knowing a good fit within the culture. Yeah. I think it's great to hear the CEO at that level. That just excites anybody coming into that business because yeah. it can be very diminishing whenever somebody externally comes in and there's a lack of internal promotion because that takes yeah. away the value piece. And even actually looking, I know with Exigy, I think your average tenure is pretty impressive with your employees. Yes, I started the New York Stock Exchange, but the New York Stock Exchange was acquired by other firms and eventually it became Exigy. So I've been there 13 years and most of the managers in my team have been there for, for 10 years plus and some of the rest of the staff are over 10 years as well. So it's brilliant. We've retained our staff and it is really because we promote from within. People don't really have to look externally for their promotions. So yeah, the tenure is great and long may it continue. Absolutely. And even like recently with your latest batch of new starts, so I think you took them out for a drinks afternoon to the perch. Yeah. Was that correct? Yeah, that's right. We've got a fantastic social committee, which we formed at the start of this year, towards the end of last year. And they're brilliant. Like I'm a site lead for the Belfast team, but they do it for me, really. They make my life so much easier. They do all the kind of, they organize that. We do like a monthly wellness walk. So we meet up once a month. And we walk around uh, Shaw's Bridge and we're going to Divis Mountain, I think, next week. And 90% of the conversations are not about work. They're about what's happening outside of work and how things go on. And it's just brilliant for getting the team together and promoting mental health. So that's one thing they do. We do like monthly brunches, monthly happy hours. We go for a few drinks and we made a massive fuss around our new starts recently. So we brought on board things like seven new starts with the space of a month. And the whole week, all the other people in the office came in, made them feel welcome. And it's such a it's such a big thing when you join a new firm to have welcoming faces. I'm sure you've been there before. So yeah, so we make a massive deal around certain things. We quite big on advocating the charity events as well. So at the minute we're fundraising for the NI Hospice. We've partnered with that charity for probably the past five years or so. And we've done coffee mornings, bake sales, charity raffles. What else have we done? Spin cycles. We did a spin cycle for a day where we're rotating people and all that kind of stuff. And we're currently fundraising for the, they do a yearly dragon boat race, which takes place a couple of Fridays time. We're also the reigning champions. So we're very, very happy about that. So we have to try and retain our trophy this year. But, but yeah, it, it's just a great culture and a testament to the, the social committee that we have in the office. They're a great bunch and they, they really do help uh, with the culture that we have in, in XG in Belfast. Brilliant, brilliant. And good luck with the Dragon Boat Race as well. Yeah, um, thank you. E even the wellness walk, even our team did Cave Hill this morning for sunrise. Brilliant, brilliant. And I think you're right. It's just stepping outside the four walls when yep. you get to know your team a lot better in, in a different setting, side of the work chat. So I think that's invaluable to have that on a monthly basis, yeah. along with the other bait stuff that you're doing. Yeah, I think it's something to do with like fresh air and just walking at the same time, but just like promotes a healthier mind space and as I say, most of the conversations aren't about work, but some of the conversations about work as well, the kind of the, even the brainstorming side of things, you get more, you get better solutions, better answers to things too. Yeah. yeah. And I'm a huge believer that emotion comes from motion. So I couldn't yeah. agree more. What advice would you have for any aspiring technologist in today's market? This kind of goes back to the, the tenure side of things. I think, I think patience is, is a big thing. The Belfast tech market is booming and it's great to see. And there's so many different jobs out there, but. I think sometimes just the, the kind of culture we have today, everybody wants everything right now and it's pushed upon us. You have to get that promotion. You have to be senior. You have to be a manager. But sometimes you're better off just taking your time to, to learn your craft, understand your current industry, try and navigate your way through your current company. And if you feel like you are ready for promotion and it hasn't quite happened yet, just be patient because if your manager believes in you, trust me as a manager, there's no better feeling than promoting staff you've hired and trained up and seeing them progress their career. So when the opportunity does arise, you will get that promotion within the, your current company. So yeah, just, just to take a bit of time. And I think that even like browsing through LinkedIn, look at the likes and comments on a posting around a new job, someone who's moved company, got a new job compared to someone who celebrates a work anniversary. It's night and day, but I don't think we celebrate tenure and kind of stem within a company and navigating your way through a company. And you know, that shows the company values you. If someone says, oh, I just posted a 10 year anniversary at a company. That means you're valued. That means you've done everything they can to try and keep you. You're challenged and whatnot. So I think just have patience. It's a long career. 
the retirement age by the time you retire is going to be God knows what. Don't be too quick just to jump around because what you'll find is if you jump around a, a year here, a year there, you probably don't find you're building your skill as much because when you're new in a company, it takes you three, six months to, to become useful. So take your time. It's a long career. And yeah, if you find a good company who, you know, is challenging you from a technical perspective, you've got a good manager who believes in you, you've got a good team, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. So yeah, that's probably the biggest advice I could give to people. Brilliant, brilliant tips. It's about being present. And you're right, actually, it's a great observation. But if you look at tenure, celebrate tenureism, you're right. People moving jobs, you get the likes and the comments, but in actual fact, yeah. if there's a decade anniversary, wow, that's a great yeah. achievement. And that's a testament yeah. to the person and the company, which should yeah. be celebrated more. I completely agree. To so wrap things up, what's the future for Exigy? Yeah, so we've, we've lots of different things happening. It's such a global firm. So we're headquartered in St. Louis, but in Belfast, I'll speak on the Belfast side of things because I'm the site lead there. So as I say, we've hired seven, eight people over the past the past month or so. So it's really a case of building up the office, trying to build our brand internally as well. XG has only been in Belfast for around two years now. They acquired a firm called Vela. So it's building our brand presence and to the help of different firms like Search 5.0 have been a great partner for us. They've invited us to some different events. So it's building our brand. Um, we'll be getting involved next year in a graduate program as well. So working with the universities. We do have a couple of placement students at the minute. Getting more active with the local universities is, is important to us as well. So yeah, building the brand, getting our name out there and building a really strong team within the Belfast office. And I must say, just on this, pod, on this podcast, that our team in Belfast is exceptional. We have such a, a good group of managers and you mentioned the tenure side of things as well. Great leaders across engineering departments, support QA departments as well. So we have a really talented team and a team I'm proud to, to be a part of. So yeah, so much the same. Just get our name out there and try and onboard some more staff, hopefully before the end of year as well. This features pride, yep. which is exciting to hear. And if people want to find out more about your good self or XG, how do they go about doing this? Yeah, you can go to www.xd.com. And for myself, you can find me on LinkedIn. Brilliant. Paddy, this has been a really good conversation. And thanks so much for your time. Yes, no problem at all. Thanks, Stephen.